Hi everyone, my name is Paul Pacheski and welcome to the Real Estate Classroom YouTube channel where my mission is simple to help you pass your real estate exam the first time. Continuing with our vocabulary words today, 284 through 291 of 300. 284 is novation. Novation is a very complicated concept for many students to, to visualize and understand. It's simply when a contract is novated, both the parties to that contract they have certain responsibilities, certain obligations to that contract. And it allows one party of the two, one of the two parties that's enjoined in that contract to be replaced. Let me give you an example. So let's say that Sally has borrowed the money from XYZ lender. Sally's paid on this, this mortgage for 10 years. Sally wants to retire and move away. So Sally's daughter, Samantha, wants the house. So instead of going and getting a brand new loan, because remember, mom has been paying on this for many, many years. They paid the interest down. It's a low, uh, it's a low interest rate. It's a low payment. Her daughter can substitute her mom. So basically what they do is all the loan documents stay the same. They just replace the names. So they will remove mom name, mom's name from all the documents in the contract and put, sell, or put put the daughter's name in there. And that's that's the basic example or situation to explain novation. Novation simply means we're transferring all the obligations and duties from one party to a contract to another. Number 285 is a land contract. A land contract is a very common contract in real estate. It's actually a contract. Um, and it's also a financing instrument all at the same time. So let me explain how a normal real estate transaction works. The seller has their house up for sale. The buyer wants to buy it. The buyer doesn't have the money, so they go to the lender. The lender borrows them the money so they can purchase the house. At the closing table, the bank gives the seller the money. The buyer signs all of these, these mortgage documents, and then the lender... Well, before the lender places a lien against the property, the seller, once they get their money from the bank, they will transfer title. Remember, title in real estate means ownership. They will transfer the title or the ownership to the buyer, and then the bank immediately puts a lien against the property uh, in case the buyer doesn't perform, then they can foreclose on the property. Now, here's the key thing to remember. The, the title, remember, title is ownership. Title to the property has passed to the buyer, and the bank simply has put a lien against the property. That's all they do. So a land contract looks the same, but behind the scenes, it's really not. So same scenario, seller wants to sell, buyer wants to buy, buyer doesn't have the money, but they have, let's say, for example, bad credit. So instead of going to the bank, what'll happen is the owner of the property and the purchaser, they sit down at the table, at the closing table. Typically, an attorney will draft up the land contract. The purchaser signs the land contract. The difference in a land contract versus the, the first scenario where they borrow the money to the bank is title, remember title is ownership, does not pass. So what happens is the owner of the property retains the legal title and the borrower, the purchaser, receives what's called equitable title or equitable interest. Equitable interest simply means that, the, that a person has the right to future title to the property once all their obligations and duties have been performed. That's all it means. So basically, the seller is financing their equity in the property instead of the borrower going to the bank and, and borrowing the money. It can be a really effective way in a lot of different situations for the borrower to get the property um, when they otherwise couldn't. And it's actually advantageous to the seller because, for example, many property investors like to sell properties on land contract because what it does is extends out all their capital gains taxes. It provides a monthly source of income. So there are advantages to doing this type of transaction. Now, there are a couple of things that you have to know for the exam uh, as well. Every party to a real estate transaction has a legal name. So in our land contract situation, the borrower, I'm sorry, the, the buyer, they're legally called the vendee with two E's on the end. 
and the owner of the property is called the vendor with an O-R on the end. And you also have to remember that the owner or the seller retains a legal title and the vendee, which is the purchaser, they obtain equitable title or equitable interest. Equitable title, equitable interest mean the same thing. Amortization is another key you have to know. Amortization is a process of liquidation or repayment of a debt that is owed, let's say to the bank, in installment payments over a period of time. So when you go and you borrow money to purchase a vehicle or you borrow money to purchase a home, there is a term and then there is a monthly payment. So for example, maybe it's a 30 year mortgage and over the next 30 years, every month, you're gonna pay $1,000 a month to the bank. That's an installment payment and it's consistent over a stated period of time. You borrow money from the bank to purchase a car, it's a five-year uh, term. That means over every month for the next five years, you're gonna pay a certain amount of money every month until that is paid off in five years. That's all amortization is. 287, let's talk about equity. It's a, it's a common term that we throw around in the real estate business. And equity is simply the difference between the value of a piece of real property and the amount of debt that's levied against it. Now, the, the simplest of examples is the market value of your home that you owned is $100,000. Uh, you have an $80,000 mortgage that's owed. That means your equity is 20% or $20,000. It can be stated in a dollar amount or it can be stated in a per percentage. So you have $20,000 equity. Now, what is usury? Well, we really see this in uniform commercial code more so than the real estate industry, but it does come into play because banks have to comply with usury laws and so do other financing companies like credit cards and et cetera. Usury is simply a law that's passed by every state because every state has their form of usury laws that cap what an interest rate or the maximum amount of interest rate that can be charged. So let's say in your state, the most a credit card company, a bank can charge for, or charge for interest on buying a vehicle or a home is 20%. If a credit card company decided to start charging 25% in your state, then they would be violating the usury laws in their state. So usury is simply put, charging an interest rate that exceeds what's allowed by law in your specific state. What is a discount point? Now, a discount point is a lender fee or a lender charge. It's very common in our business. A lender will charge a discount point and it increases the yield on the loan, which simply means it increases the amount of profit that the lender is going to get from borrowing the money to you because banks are in the business of making money by borrowing money and there are certain fees associated with them borrowing that money to you, and one of them is a discount point. So a discount point, though, can be used for a couple of different things. First of all, it could be that the bank is, uh, for example, the lower the amount of loan. It's very common in our industry. Let's say you're going to borrow $80,000. That's a low mortgage. It's very hard for the bank to sell that to investors on the secondary mortgage market. So to make it a little bit more attractive to borrow you that money, then they'll charge a discount point or two discount points or three discount points to make it a little bit more lucrative for them or make it a little bit more marketable if they wanna sell it on the secondary mortgage market. Another way we use discount points is if you as the borrower wants to buy down the interest rate, then you can pay discount points. Because if the lower the, the interest rate, the lower the yield is, or the profit, if you will, on that loan for the lender. So a discount point, one discount point, very important, one discount point is equal to 1% of the amount borrowed. I guarantee you in some form or fashion, you're going to have a discount point math problem on your exam. So if you were to borrow from the bank $100,000, now that's different than the purchase price, right? So let's say your purchase price is $120,000. You're gonna put $20,000 down and as a down payment. 
and you're going to borrow 100,000, the amount that you are borrowing or the amount of that mortgage is $100,000. $100, so if the bank is charging one discount point, that means on that $100,000 loan, you're going to pay $1,000. It's 1% 1 of the amount that's borrowed. Keep in mind on your dis on your um, on your exam. You have to remember it's the amount borrowed and not the purchase price or the value of the property. It's the amount of money that you're borrowing. And that trips up so many students and then they end up missing that math problem on their exam. 290 is loan to value. Sometimes it's referred to as the LTV or the loan to value ratio. It is a ratio, not unlike equity. The ratio of the amount that's owed to the appraised value or the purchase price. So if the bank's going to give, um, let's say the bank has a policy, just throwing this out there, of an 80% loan to value ratio, meaning they're only going to loan up to 80% of the value of the loan. The value of or the appraised value of that house is $100,000. That means based on the loan requirements, there's an 80% loan to value. So that means it's an 80% loan to value ratio. And the bank is only going to loan $80,000 on that $100,000 property. That is an LTV or loan to value ratio. Promissory note. By the way, it's not a promissory note with an A. It's a promissory note. And it is a written instrument. It's a document that is signed by the mortgagor. The mortgagor is the borrower. Okay, the mortgagee with two E's is the lender. So the mortgage or the borrower, borrower signs the promissory note. The promissory note is a promise to repay, a, repay a debt according to the following instructions and terms and conditions. All right, let me give you an example. Remember, it's not the collateral. It's just a promise to repay a debt over a certain period of time uh, under these conditions. So when you buy a vehicle, the lender always wants the title to the vehicle. You'll get your registration, your pink slip or whatever color it is in your state to prove that you own it if you get pulled over. But the actual title, the actual proof that you are the official owner, that is collateral. The bank is going to borrow you the money, but in return, they want the title to that vehicle until that vehicle is paid off and then they'll send you the title. The reason they want the title is that's the collateral. So if you stop making your payments, that's the security for the debt, then they can repossess the car. Now, the promissory note is a document that has all the language that says, if, if we're going to borrow you the car, then it's going to be, we're going to borrow you $20,000. You're going to repay it over 72 months at an interest rate of 4.5%, etc. cetera. It outlines all the 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 terms and conditions of the the loan so then you every month are going to make your payment in accordance with the promissory note but if you stop making your payment you're in breach of that promissory note which is a promise to repay a debt then the bank will because they have the title to the car then they will move forward with repossession a promissory note is um, nothing more than a promise to repay a debt now, again, as I said, if the bank didn't have the title to the vehicle, but they only had the promissory note, they could not repossess. That's why it's so important that they have the collateral. When you think of a, a house, you're buying a house. If you live in a deed state, then the deed of trust, and we've talked about these terms in previous videos, the deed of trust is the collateral, um, and the promissory note is the promise to repay a debt. Without that deed of trust, they cannot foreclose on the property. If you are in a mortgage state, promissory note is the promise to repay a debt, and the mortgage is the actual collateral, which gives the bank the right to foreclose and get you out of that property. Promissory, promissory note is simply a promise to repay a debt, and it's a written instrument. Key thing with the promissory note in a mortgage or a promissory note in the deed of trust is they are actually two separate, distinct, individual legal instruments. And that's also a key to remember as well. Now, if you're going to continue studying, check out this video right here. Best of luck, everybody, with your studies.